Okay, this is a talk about soft typing. Now, soft typing is something that Matt spoke about at RubyConf last year, and he spoke about it as one of the possibilities for Ruby 3. So what is soft typing? Well, in essence, it's a way of combining the benefits of static typing with the flexibility of dynamic typing. So to give you an example of what this might mean, here's a little piece of Ruby code, a very simple thing. It's just a method that takes an argument, anything, and then calls times two in it. Now, because this is Ruby, we don't need to tell it anything about the types. But this also means we don't know much about the types. But there are some things we can work out. So for example, just by looking at the code, we can say that this thing, whatever it is, has to respond to the times two. And we go a little bit further. We can say, if we call this method passing in some kind of object, this object also has to respond to times two. And we know that if it doesn't respond to times two, then our code is gonna explode with some kind of runtime error. So the important thing to get across here is, when I say static typing, static means that we can work stuff out without having to run the code. And this is a huge idea for Ruby. Previously in Ruby, there's no way of thinking about things like correctness without running the code. But this is a big philosophical shift in the way that we think about things like correctness in Ruby. So given that this is a candidate for Ruby 3, and given that it's such a big deal, you think a lot of people would be talking about soft typing. But nobody really seems to be. There was one talk by Tom Stewart at RubyConf Australia called Consider Static Typing. And this serves as a kind of primer on types and what they're useful for. And at the end, he says a little bit about soft typing in Ruby, but not that much. But apart from that, I've heard nothing. And even worse than that, going to conferences and speaking to people, nobody seems to be thinking about it, and nobody seems to be talking about it. So I'd like to address that today. And I thought it would be a good idea to give a talk about what soft typing is and how it works. And that really means talking about type reconstruction for a lit-binding structure type language such as Ruby, and then working out how we deal with the inevitable failures. I thought it would be a good idea to talk about this, but then I wrote the talk, and it turns out it's actually really boring. There's an awful lot of really heavy academic theory in there, and I think a lot of you would just get up and leave. And worse than that, it's boring, and it's also really difficult. I mean, I'm not sure I actually could talk to you about how soft typing works. It's too hard for me. And if that wasn't bad enough, it's also really impractical. I mean, even if I could teach it to you, by the end of it, all you'd know is some mathematics about type systems in functional languages like ML that have never left academia, and you couldn't really take that and apply it to your everyday Ruby work. So boring, difficult, and impractical. This is gonna be like the best talk you've ever seen. <laughs> now, I think this is the way a lot of people think about type theory in general. And certainly, if you've read the soft typing paper, these are some words that are very good for describing it. But this isn't the way that I feel about type theory, and it's not the way that I feel about type theory in Ruby. I think it's actually a really exciting area. I think it's something that we can engage with as Rubyists, and I think it's something that can improve our Ruby code. So what I want to do today is try and make it more accessible. I can't tell you everything you need to know about soft typing, but I can maybe tell you where to start or give you an idea of how to explore this topic. I'm gonna do this today by writing a static type analyzer. So what is a static type analyzer and how do you write it? Well, there's a talk by a guy called Matt Might. He's a professor at the University of Utah. And the talk is, what is static analysis? And quite early on in this talk, he gives a, a kind of general formula for how we write a static analysis tool like a static type analyzer. And he says, what we do is we take an interpreter and we make it more abstract. So to give you an idea of what this means, imagine you've written a program and you feed it into the interpreter, and what the interpreter is designed to do is run the code and produce the resultant value. Okay, so you might run your program and it produces the value 42. Now to make this more abstract, we still return the same kind of thing, just with less detail. So instead of saying the answer is 42, we'd say the answer is just a number. It's something more abstract about the value. And it doesn't have to be as clearly about types as a number. You could say it's a number greater than 10, or maybe we just say it's a value. And that can be a useful thing to know on some occasions. So I'm gonna write a static type analyzer by writing an interpreter, but I'm not gonna do this for Ruby. Ruby is a very complicated language and we get bogged down in the details very quickly. So instead of that, what I'm gonna do is create a very simple language, a very simple programming language. Then I'm gonna write an interpreter for this in Ruby. Then I'm gonna write a static type analyzer by making my interpreter more abstract. Okay, so this is the language I wanna start with and it is very, very simple. Okay, I can take some numbers and I can assign it to a variable and then later on, I can recover that variable. So how do we in write an interpreter for this? I think it's kind of helpful to think about how we interpret this as human beings. 
And the first thing I want to observe is that we don't just see this as some kind of big amorphous blob of code. We break it down in our minds into some structure and we say, okay, these different lines are different expressions in our language. And they're not the same kinds of expressions. We can say that the top line is probably an assignment and the second line is just using a variable. And if we look at this assignment line, well, the reason we think it's an assignment is probably because it's got the equals in the middle of it. And once we recognize it's being an assignment, we can say the thing on the left-hand side is some kind of identifier. It's telling us where to store the value. And the thing on the right-hand side is the value we're going to store. And it's not just any value. We can look at this and say this is clearly a number. So that's maybe how we see it. But for a computer, it looks entirely different. It just looks like an undifferentiated sequence of characters, like an A and then a space and an equals and so on. So the first challenge is to take this and impose the structure back on it. And the way we do this is by writing a parser. So we're going to take this string of characters, feed it into a parser, and it's going to spit out some kind of structured data. So how do we write a parser? Well, this is Ruby, so of course there's a gem for it. In fact, there are many gems for it. The one I'm going to use today is called Parslet. I find it quite easy to work with. And I'm almost ready to get started, but before we start, I need to work out a name for this. Just for practical reasons, I need to name some classes, so I'm going to give a name to my language. And what do we call this? Well, maybe we can pick a name based on the characteristics of our language. So like it's simple, okay? But it's not just simple, it's like really, really obscenely simple. And this makes it kind of accessible at the start, but after a while we realize it's actually quite limiting. And not only is it limiting, the more we work with it, the more frustrating it becomes, right? So I'm gonna name this after something that's like obscenely simple and really very limited and just becomes more and more frustrating. Oh, sorry, that shouldn't be in there. <laughs> So for no particular reason, I'm going to call this language Trump. <laughs> okay, so let's start writing our parser. To do this, I'm just going to write a class, and I'm going to call it Trump Parser. And it's going to inherit from Parslet Parser. And the way that the Parslet Parser works oops, is you give it a set of rules that describe how to match the input string. Okay, and we're going to start by telling it where to begin. You, you give it something called a root. And the root that we identified when we first looked at the program was that it was a series of expressions. So we just say, to start parsing this program, look for expressions. Okay, now we need to tell it what we mean by expressions. So we'll write a rule for that. We'll have a rule that says expressions are a single expression, but we're going to repeat this. So there could be more than one of these things. Okay, and this is how we tell Parslet that this thing repeats at least one time. So now we need to tell it what we mean by expression. So again, we just write another rule. We say an expression. And now there are different types of expression in our language, but we're going to start by just assuming it's always going to be a number. This helps us get started, then we can add in the structure later. So I'm going to say an expression is just a number. And finally, we'll tell it what we mean by number. Okay, so number. And in this case, we're going to say a number is one or more digits. So we can tell it to match a digit by saying match and then passing backslash D, which will match zero to nine. And then we say, there may be more than one of these, so we'll say repeat, and there's gonna be at least one. Okay, so now what we can do is we can create a, like a sample program, a source string for our program. We'll just set it to be a number for now. And then we can create an instance of our, par uh, our parser class, so we'll just call new and that. Then we can tell it to parse the input string. Okay, and then we'll look at what this, oops. If you look at what this produces, we can see it gives the string back to us, followed by this at zero. What this is actually telling me is that our parser will accept the input program. It thinks it's a valid program. Now, if we make it invalid, so let's say we add some letters into here that we haven't told it how to match, and then we run this again, it throws an error, and it says, I don't understand how to parse this. It rejects our program. We put it back to being a number and run it. It's now happy again to accept our input. Okay, we don't want to match just one number, and we want to match multiple expressions. So in theory, we should be able to do this. But when we run this, it explodes, and it says, there's something I don't recognize at character four, which is a space character. So we need to be really, really precise with our parser, which is very annoying when you're live coding. So what I need to do is tell it how to handle space. So I'm gonna create a couple of rules for this. I'll say a space, we just wanna match, and then we can use backslash s, which is any kind of space character. And there may be many of these, so we'll say repeat at least once. And then we'll write another rule, which is called space question mark, which says it's a space, or it might not be. And the reason we use this is because our first number is followed by space, but our second number is not followed by space. And we want a rule that matches both of those. What we then do is we say, when we have a number, it may be followed by a space. Okay, so the, the double chevrons just say followed by. And if we run this again, we can see it now gives our numbers back to us. It now accepts the input. Now, this isn't very good. We don't just want a string back. What we want to do is apply some structure back onto our input code. So what we can do in Parslet is we can say, I'm interested in this thing, this number, and then we just give it a tag. We say, match this as a number. 
And now when I run it, the output's very different. It's now an array of hashes, and these hashes say, here's a number that you told me to match, and here is the bit of the input string that I identified when I matched this. Okay, so that's how we match numbers. We can now um, bulk out our expression because we have more than just numbers in our language, right? We can say it could also be an assignment or it could be just a single variable. And then we need to write rules for these. Okay, so the rule for an assignment is we have some kind of identifier and this is followed by uh, an equals sign and then that's followed by some kind of value. So then we need to write the rules for all these things. So identifier we'll start with. So identifier, uh, I've decided identifiers are just lowercase sequences of letters. Oops. So we can match A to Z, lowercase A to Z. Okay, and this repeats um, at least one times, and it's maybe followed by space as well. Uh, equals is even simpler. Um, so we write a rule for equals. And this is just literally the character equals. Okay, so stra here just means literally this character, no kind of fancy regex matching. And again, this might have a space after it. Everything's gonna have a space after it. Now, value is interesting. The things that we can assign to um, any kind of identifier is not just a number, it could also be another variable, or it could also be another assignment. So really what we're saying here is that any kind of expression is valid as being the value. And then we'll just tag these things. So we'll say we're gonna match this as a value, we're gonna match the identifier as a target, it's a bit long now. Um, and then we're going to wrap this whole lot up. I'm going to say we match the whole thing as an assign. Okay. And then we have another rule that we need to write for variable. Now, this is really easy. Um, a variable is just an identifier. So we just match the identifier and we match it as being a variable. We just tag it. Okay. Now, another couple of things I need to do. So I want to change my source string to be more realistic. So we had something like a equals six and then a. Now you see we've put a new line at the end of here and there's a new line at the very end of our program, so I need to tell it how to cope with these things. So we'll say it may start with a space and our expressions may also end with a space. Okay, if I've typed this right first time live on stage, which would be amazing. Oh, I did. Okay, um, it works and it gives us back a structured representation of our input string. Hold the applause, this may still be broken later. <laughs> okay, so what we've done so far is we've taken our um, source of uh, just characters and we've turned it into these tree-like structures. We've imposed some structure back on top of it. But I don't really want to work with arrays of hashes. That's not a good way of working in Ruby. So I want to take it a step further and turn these things into objects. And to do that, Parsley provides something called a transform. And it's a similar principle. Instead of matching against our characters, we're going to match against our tree and we're going to turn those into something more useful. Okay, so to do this, we're just going to create a new class, and it's going to be called Trump Transform. And this is going to inherit from Parslet Transform. Okay, and again, we're just going to build some rules in here. Now, the output tree from our uh, from our parser step looks a little bit like this. It's not exactly this, but it's pretty close to this. Okay, now if I create an instance of my transform, and then I apply it to that tree, what this does is it gives me back an unmodified version of the tree. Okay, so it doesn't have any rule to tell it how to transform any of this, so it just leaves it untouched. So we can start to write some rules. And I'm gonna start with variable because variable is a much, it's a very simple structure inside this tree. So the rule for this is we just say, when we match a, the key variable, okay, followed by some kind of value, it's just a simple value here, it's just a, a little bit of text. And I'm gonna call that an identifier. And then we give it a body, and the body says, use this as a replacement for whatever you match. So I can just get it to say, for example, hello. And if we go down and run my code again, we can see that the variable is gone from the end, and it's replaced it with the stuff in the blocks here. Now, I don't want to really return a string saying hello. I want to return a Ruby object that we can use. So I'm just going to require a file where I have to find some basic objects, and all that's in here at the minute is the initializer to take an argument and then some kind of inspect so we can see what's going on. Now, I'm going to use it in here, so instead of returning a string, I'll return a new instance of my variable class. I'm going to pass in the identifier to that, okay? And then we can write something very similar for the other parts of our input string. So we can write it for matching numbers and for matching assignments. So if I go down here and run this, we can see that it's now turning it into Ruby objects when it says assign colon and then number colon and so on. This is showing me that it's matching my Ruby objects, 
Okay, so we can now go from a source input stream to Ruby objects. We're kind of in this situation now. And these objects represent single expressions inside my program. Okay, so now that we can match stuff, I can start to write the interpreter proper. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take each expression, so we'll take, for example, this assign, and I'm gonna call eval on it. And what I want eval to do is basically run this code for me. And really what I mean is I want it to turn it into the simplest possible form it can. Now the simplest possible form from an assignment is gonna be the simplest possible form of its value. And the value here is a number. So then we need to go again and say, okay, number, what is your simplest possible form? And for that, I'm just gonna return the Ruby integer. So in this case, calling eval on assign is just gonna return the value six. Now because it's an assignment, we also need to do some side effect as well. So we need to go to our environment at this point and say, please remember that the value A has got, sorry, the identifier A has got the value six. And that's it, that's what eval means when we call it an assignment. Now if we're calling it on a variable, this is very easy. It just goes up to the environment and says, hey, give me whatever the value is for the identifier A, and that of course is also six, okay? So I'm gonna go and pull this all together now. I've written a class for the environment. It's just really a wrapper around the hash. It lets me get and set stuff using a nicer API. Um, but I've got all the parts in place that I can start writing my interpreter. To do that, I'm gonna write a method called nodes, and it's gonna take some source string. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that and pass it to the um, parser, uh, and then we call parse on that, passing in the string, okay? And then I'm gonna take the output from that, which is gonna be some kind of tree, I'm gonna pass it straight into the transform. Okay, and then that's gonna give me the Ruby objects back. So when I say nodes, a single node is really just an expression in my program. I'm just gonna test that works, because if that doesn't work, we're gonna be in trouble later. So our program looked a bit like this. And we just call nodes with the source, and then check it. Excellent, that's never happened before. Um, so we now get the Ruby objects back out again, which is what we wanted. Okay, so now that we have our nodes, we can write a method called interpret. Oops, no we can't because we can't spell. Okay, and this is gonna take the source thing again. Now, when I said we were gonna write interpreter by calling eval, uh, one of the things we had to deal with the side effecting and putting stuff into the environment. So I'm gonna create something called env, which is a new instance of the environment. Okay, and this is like our global state in the program, which is where we're gonna put all our global variables. Then I'm simply gonna take the nodes, okay, by calling this nodes method. And I'm gonna say, I'm gonna map these into, take each node, and I'm just gonna call eval on them. So I'm gonna take node.eval, and I'm gonna pass in the environment at that point. And then these eval methods will modify the environment as they go along. Okay, so now we can replace this call to nodes with a call to interpret, but this isn't gonna work yet because we haven't actually written the eval methods. So if I run this, it says I've got to assign, I've tried to call eval, but I can't call this yet. So what I'm gonna go do is go and write those eval methods. And these are all very simple. Okay, so to evaluate a variable, gets passed in the environment, and I said, we simply go and look it up in the environment. So we just say env.get, and then we pass an identifier. For a number, okay, again, we'll write eval. It gets passed in the environment, but it doesn't use it. We'll just chuck it away. And to evaluate a number, I said, we just return the numerical value. Okay, so all we do here is write value. And then finally, to evaluate an assignment, it gets past the environment. Now, I said to evaluate an assignment, we go to its value, and we evaluate that, passing in the environment at this point. Okay, then we take that, and we set it in the environment. So we say, oh, env.set, and then we use the identifier as the key, and then we'll um, set the value to be whatever the evaluation of our value is. So we go back here and run this. We can see it now gives us a new array with each value set to six. Okay, so when it evaluates the first expression, it says the simplest form of this is just the value six. And then when it evaluates the second expression, it then goes and looks up an environment and says, okay, this is also a six. So that's our interpreter and that's great, but we're not really here to write an interpreter, we're here to write a type checker. So the next step to do is to write the type checking algorithm. Now, this works just like eval, but it's more abstract. Okay, so instead of calling eval on our, um, on our nodes, I'm gonna call type instead. When we call type, it works in the same way. The assignment will go to its value and say, hey, value, what is your type? In this case, it's a number. Now, a number is gonna be like a primitive type in this language, so we can just give it a name. I'm gonna say the type of number is number type. So the type of the assignment is also number type, 
And again, we, because there's side effects, we're going to go and update something called a context. Now, the context is just like the environment, but when I say context, I mean it stores types. So when I talk about context, I'm always talking about types. When I'm talking about environment, I'm always talking about variables. Sorry, values. Okay, so that's how we work out the type for assignment. To work out the type for the variable, it's the same process. We just go back up to the context and we say, hey, what's the type that's been set for the identifier A? Okay, so we can go and write these things. So in here, we can say a new method called type, it gets passed to context. These are gonna look very similar to the eval. So instead of saying m.get, we say context.get, and we just pass in the identifier. Okay, for number, we call type, it gets passed to context, doesn't use it. Uh, this is a print of type, so we say number type dot new. Okay, I need to go and write number type, so I don't have that yet. So we just write a quick class called number type. And the other thing inside here, I'll just add an inspect method so we can see what's going on. It'll just print out number, like that. Okay, so that's the type for number. Um, the type for an assign is gonna be very similar to the eval for an assign. It gets passed to context. Okay, we go to our value, we say what is your type, passing in the context. And then we take that and we set it in the context so it gets remembered for later. Pass an identifier as the key, and it's like that, okay? So if we come back to here, we can then write our type check method. In fact, it's very, very similar to the interpret method. It's so similar, I'm gonna just copy and paste it. Always a good programming practice. Okay, so we could call this type check. Now, instead of creating an environment, I'm gonna create a context so we can remember that it stores types. We'd still map over the nodes, same as before, but instead of calling eval, we call type, and instead of passing an M, we pass in context. Okay, and then down here, I can change the call to interpret to a call to type check, run the code, and you can see it says number for both these expressions. So that's great. What we've just written is something which is a type analyzer for a very simple language. And it does this without us having to add any type information to our source code. It goes and works it out just by looking at what the source code is. And this is okay, but it's a little bit boring because we only have one type in our language, so it's always gonna say number. So what I'm gonna do is make this a little bit more interesting. I'm gonna add some more constructs to our language. Particularly, I'm gonna add functions because functions are pretty useful. So to write a function, I'm gonna use the keyword fn. It's then gonna be followed by a parameter list, so say like x and y. Then it's gonna have a body inside these parentheses, inside these braces. In this case, I'll just return the first argument. Okay, so that creates a function. Then we're gonna assign it to a, a variable, like we do for a normal value. So we'll say like first is equal to a function, which returns the first argument. And then once we've created a function like this, we can then call it by taking the identifier, following it by a bracket, and then passing in some arguments. So we can pass in, for example, a and two. Then when we run this, we would expect it to return the first argument. So we expect it to return a, which has got the value six. Now, I don't have time to write all the code for functions here. Um, but I can go through quickly how they work and then show you in practice. Uh, to evaluate the function, I'm gonna go through the parser step and then go through the transform step and it's gonna spit out two objects, two new types of objects, either a function or a call, like a function call. When we evaluate a function, it just returns itself, okay? It doesn't actually do anything at that point, it just returns itself. The reason we return self is because then when we assign it, the assignment will have the type, or sorry, the value of that function and it's that function gets stored in the environment. And that means when we do a function call, we can then go to the environment and look it up by the um, identifier, in this case first, it'll return that function object and we just pass the call back to the function. And when we call the function, we call it with two different types of arguments. We call it with our list of arguments that we want to use for a function call and we pass in the environment at that point. And the way that function evaluation works is actually really, really simple. All we do is we create a new environment which is a child of our outer environment at that point but then we set up some special values. We set x to be the first arguments passed in, in this case six, and then y to be the second argument passed in, in this case two. Then we go to our, our function body, and we just call eval on that, on each expression inside there. But instead of calling eval with our outer environment, we call it with this new inner environment. Okay. And then that's it, that's how you write function evaluation. Okay, so I've written this in a file uh, called uh, basic functions. I hope that's the name. Okay, and we go down to here, and then I can take our source code with a function in it and run it through the interpreter. You can see that the first thing is still a equals six, it still gives us back the value six. The second thing is a function declaration, which gives us back one of these function objects. And the final thing is a function call, and it evaluates this correctly. It works out that you know, the first of a and two is in fact a, which has got the value six. Okay, so just to show it works, maybe we pass in a different value, we get a different value in the last thing in our output stream here. Okay, 
Um, so that's how we write a function, let's, or how we run a function. Let's look at the type checker for this. Now, the type checker works in a very similar way. I'm not going to go through the code again, but instead of calling eval on game back a value, we just always return the type of that value. So if I run the type checker, it says we've got a number followed by something of a function type followed by something of a number type. Okay? And that's kind of cool. So we now have two different types, and we can still infer everything without having to add any type annotations to the code. I'm going to write a more complex function. I'm going to write something called apply. And this takes three arguments. It takes an x and a y and a z. And what it does is it assumes that x is a function. So I'm going to say we're going to call this first thing that you pass in as though it were a function, passing in the arguments y and z. And then we can replace our call to first with a call to apply, and the first just becomes the first argument. So we have higher order functions here. We can pass them around. Okay. Now, if I go back and run the studio interpreter, you can see that this still works. It's getting a bit long now, so let's require pb and then preprint this. We see it still works, okay? So it still evaluates the first thing to be a six. Then we've got two function declarations for first and then apply. And then when we call apply with this complex set of arguments, it still just works, okay? It still gives back the answer we would expect. Then we run this type checker. It says that we have something of type number, and then two things of type function, and another thing of type number. Now, I'm not really happy with that. It's correct, but there's more information that we can get out of this. Okay. When we say that things are the same type, we typically mean that we can interchange them in the program, and the program will still work. You get different values out, perhaps, but the program should still work. But that's not the case for functions. The, the way that the actual type of first is not the same as the actual type for apply. Okay, they are both functions, but first is a function that accepts two arguments and is a particular return type, and apply is something that takes three arguments, and one of those arguments has to be another function, and it's got a very different return type. So I'm not really happy with the way this works. I, I think we can do better. Okay, so this is our function, and we can say, well, wh what do we think the type of this is? Now, when we declare a function, we don't know what the type of x is, and we don't know what type of y is. We're not going to know these things until runtime. But we do know there are two of them, and we know that they can have any type at all. Okay, so we're going to say the type of this is it takes two parameters of any type. Then it returns something, and we don't know what it returns yet. We won't know until runtime, but we can say it returns something of any type. And that's kind of true, but it's not the full story, because the thing that gets passed in as the first parameter x is also the thing that gets returned. So the any type for the parameter is also the any type that has to be used for return. So instead of just saying any type, I'm going to use type variables. I'm going to say the type of x is a. We don't know what a is yet. It's just a variable that will be filled in later with a value. But crucially, I can use a later on, and it's the same thing. And that's the important point. And for apply, we can go even further. If we start off the same way, we say we use type variables for the three different arguments that passed in. And then when we look at return type, well, the return type is whatever A applied to B and C is. The trouble is that we said that A is any type, and applying any type doesn't make any sense. So we, we get an error at this point. It doesn't know what the return type is. But we can work out more information by looking at the definition of the function body. OK, so we look at where these variables are used. We can say that. A isn't any type. That means we don't yet know what it's going to be. But it's not any type, really. It's constrained to be a function, and particularly a function that takes two arguments of types B and C. Now, because we know it's a function, we then know it's going to return something. And we don't know what it's going to return yet because we don't know what the type is for sure. But we do know it's going to have some return type. So we can just use a new type variable, D in this case, as the return type. OK, so now we can go back and we can say the full type of this function is something that takes another function of type B and C mapped to D, and then two more arguments of type B and C, and then it returns something of type D. Now, don't worry about the detail here. I know this looks really confusing. The most important thing to notice from this is we could, we could find a lot of information about the type of this function just by looking at the source code. We haven't had to tell it anything. We haven't had to tell it what the types are. It can go and rebuild the type information just by looking at the source code. OK, so I've written this up, and again, it's in a file called better functions this time. OK, so I can go down here, and just to make sure it still works, I can call my interpreter, and it still gives me back the correct answers. But this time, when I ask it to do a type check, it gives me back a lot more information. OK? Instead of just saying it's any old function, this time it's saying it's a function which takes something of type A and something of type B and then returns something of type A again. And for the apply, it gives me this detailed thing about the type of the function. It's something that takes another function and then a couple of arguments and returns the return type of the first parameter, first parameter being function. Okay? There's quite a lot of information we can extract from this. And this can be quite useful as well. If we make a mistake in our code, 
For example, if I call apply and pass in A, and A in this case is just a number, it's not a function, okay? It's gonna raise an error, it's gonna raise in this case a type error, but it can not only tell us that it's wrong, it can tell us or it can give some hints about why it's wrong and what it expects instead. So it's saying you gave me a number, but I expect it's a function, and in particular I expect it's a function of type B and C mapped to D. So this is kind of useful, and we can do all of this without having to add any type information into our source code. We can do it all just by looking and reconstructing the types. Okay, one final thing I want to add to our language. I want to add something called maybe. The way maybe works is you can add it before any expression, okay? And the behavior of maybe is it will either run the expression or it won't. Now, this seems a little bit weird, but I'm using it to simulate a lot of the uncertainty we get at runtime in real programming languages. And what the implementation maybe has got a random number generated in it, and half of the time it will just run the function and return whatever the value was from that, and the other half of the time it will just explode and just kind of mess with you as a developer. So I'm gonna go and pull in the definition of this. It's in a file called maybe. Okay, and if I go down and run the interpreter in this, Sorry, I'm gonna set it back to first as well. Okay, I don't know at this point whether or not it's gonna work. It's up to the random number generator. It may work and just give me back the answers that we saw before, or it might explode. So first time running it, it worked. Okay, so it picked the, the random number that was high enough that said run the expression. If I run it again, it worked. This is the great thing about random things. If I run it again, oh fuck's sake. If I run it again, <laughs> Yay, <laughs> it broke that time, okay? So we can see in this case, instead of returning the thing, it just returned ha ha, and the whole thing blew up. Okay, so what about types for this? If I run the type checker, I mean, what can we say the type of, for example, first is, because it's got this maybe in place, we don't know what's gonna happen, and what's the type of applying something with a maybe? So think about this, what's the type of A? Well, it depends. It depends on what happens at runtime. Now, if at runtime we decide to run the expression, then the type of A is gonna be something of function type, with a bit more detail. But if maybe decides not to run the function, then it's gonna be this funny mess with the developer type, which I call null here for no particular reason. So, what's the type of A? Well, actually, the type of A is either null or function type, but we don't quite know. It's like a kind of Schrodinger's type. We don't know until we look in the box, okay? So when I run the type checker, this is exactly what's gonna come back. Now we have a bit of a problem because if the type is this special new type of you know, either a null or the function, can we say that this works? Because remember, we, we had something that checked that the argument passed him as the right type. And the answer is, we don't know. We don't know whether or not it's gonna be the right type and we can decide how to deal with that. Now in a strict language, you might reject it and say, we cannot guarantee that your program works. Therefore, we're gonna reject the whole thing and we're just gonna stop and say, go away and fix this. In a more permissive language, something like Ruby, for example, we're more likely to perhaps warn you about it. We'll say, hey, there's a bit of a danger here. You know, this thing might not work, but I trust you as a developer to, to get it working. You know what you're doing. Okay, so if I run the type checker now, first of all, we can see this warning, okay? It's saying, you're passing in this union type, this or type, the thing that's either a function or it's this kind of null thing. And this might not work. Okay, there's no guarantee that your, your program is valid. But then we look at it, it carries on and does the full type check. And actually the final return type, it doesn't quite know what's gonna happen either. It says the whole thing is either gonna produce a number or it's just gonna explode. We don't really know, okay? It's not always gonna be this ambiguous though. So for example, if I say A is maybe a six and run the type checker, okay, you can see the type of our first expression is now set to either number or this null type, yep. We know that neither of those work for a function. So if I then pass in our maybe type here, so as the first argument to apply, it knows enough to reject it. It knows enough to say, this can never work. Okay, it doesn't matter which path we go down, it's never gonna work. So there are things we can reject, but we can't reject everything. And this is a big idea. I mean, non-determinism in programs is not our friend when we're writing a type checker. If we don't know what's gonna happen, our type checker is not gonna work very well. And in particular, it changes the nature of our type checker. I mean, initially, when we wrote type check and we said, is this program valid? It can come back and either say, yes, it's valid, or no, it's not valid. When we throw non-determinism into the mix and we say, is it valid? It can come back and say, no, this is not valid. It'll definitely never work. Or else it can say, I don't know, you go and run it and find out. And that's not very useful. 
And there's a risk that as the non-determinism increases, the value of the type checker decreases because it's saying, I don't know more of the time. I think one of the important questions to ask is, how much Ruby is non-deterministic? I don't know the answer to that. I think a lot of it is, but until we actually run this against real programs, we're not gonna know for certain. Okay, so this was supposed to be a talk about type checkers, but I spent an awful lot of time writing an interpreter and talking about how evaluation works. And that's no accident. In order to understand types, we need to understand how our interpreter works. We need to build an interpreter. And this is part of a deeper truth, that understanding types is not separate from understanding the syntax and semantics of your program. They're not two separate things. They're just different views on the same concept. And there is the idea, I think, that we can take Ruby as it is and add soft typing to it without addressing the syntax and semantics, without changing the nature of Ruby. And I think that idea is optimistic at best. I'm not convinced it's gonna work. But I don't wanna end here, I don't wanna end on a negative note. And I really don't know the answers to whether or not soft typing would be good for Ruby without changing the syntax and semantics. I certainly don't wanna stop here. Because there's something more important I've been trying to get across today. And this is that type theory and Ruby go together. Type theory is not the kind of thing that we say, we don't have to use this, we don't have to be interested in this because we don't write Java with its static type checking or we don't like play with Haskell like the other weirdos. Type theory is something that we can engage with as Rubyists and it's something that can potentially give us some benefit back. It's something that can improve our confidence that our programs are correct or will behave in the way that we expect. I think that's the most important thing I've tried to talk about today. So is type theory boring and difficult and impractical? Well, that's not for me to answer. That's a question that you guys answer. And I'm, I'm not stupid here. I know that some of you think yes to all of these. And that's fine. I mean, type theory is not for everybody. But I hope at least some of you here have found it interesting. And I find that it's more accessible than you maybe previously thought. And maybe think that there is some use for this in Ruby. And if even one person here today goes away and thinks, I'm going to explore this some more, then I'm going to count this talk as a success. So I've written up all of the code that I've used today. It's available on GitHub um, under this URL. Uh, but that's it. Thank you very much for listening. OK, that went way quicker than I expected because the code worked first time. This has never happened before. Um, I do have some time for questions. Uh, I'm generally not a big fan of questions at the end, but I am around for the next three days. So if you've got anything to say to me, you know, please come up and discuss this with me, even if it's just to say you find it very boring. I would be interested in knowing. Um, but has anybody got any questions they think they want to share with everybody else or any observations that would be worth sharing with everybody? It's a good, oh, there's a hand up over there. Okay, so the question was what do I think about the gem contracts? Um, so the gem contracts is an attempt to add some kind of structural typing onto Ruby. It, you, you kind of say, this is the type of my function. Um, it's, it's like uh, a way of adding type annotations where you're describing to Ruby the types without actually changing the Ruby parser and the interpreter. Is that, is that a good summary of contracts? Yeah. Okay, cool. So what do I think about it? Um, I think any, any tool you can run statically that gives you some more information about Ruby and the types of Ruby and the safety of Ruby is worth exploring. Personally, I don't think contracts is the right way to go. I think type reconstruction, which is what I was trying to demonstrate here today, is probably a lot more interesting where you go to your code and we try and pull out as much information as possible. Um, but I think that contracts is an interesting attempt to add type signatures and to get people thinking about types in Ruby. Uh, but unless we have a, a good way of running a tool and it coming back and saying, yes, program is valid or no, it's not, and being able to trust that tool, I'm a little bit dubious as to the value. Okay, so the question or the observation was that nil is very important in Ruby. It's like a first class citizen. It comes up a lot, and this is going to be a stumbling block to adding something like static type checking. Yep? Well, that's my guess. That's your guess. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, you're an idiot. Um, null, is <laughs> null is not a stumbling block in itself. N null in itself is not a problem. If we can correctly identify null, then everything is fine. Okay, we can handle null properly. And we can just say null will never satisfy the constraints that we need for our particular piece of program. Okay, nulls do exist in other languages. Um, you know, something like ML, for example, has got 
something. It's not undefined. It's another thing. But it, you know, in, in something like ML, which is strongly typed, they do have concepts like nil inside there. A unit, for example, can act in a null-like way. Um, so I don't think that's the problem with type checking Ruby. I don't think just having a null is, is a problem. I think the bigger problem is we don't know when there are going to be nils until we run the code. So when you access an array, for example, you don't know whether it's going to give you back a number or a hash or another array or some object or a null. We don't have access to that at the static analysis phase. And I think that's the big problem. The non-determinism non is the problem. The problem is not the fact that one of those types may be a null. Does that make sense? Any more? Yep, over there. What plugin was he using to evaluate the code? The plugin is called Seeing is Believing by Josh Cheek, who's around somewhere. I can't see him. Oh, there he is, standing up at the back. Um, I really recommend you, you check this out. It, it'll plug into pretty much any editor. Um, and it's a really good way of doing this kind of quick evaluation as you're writing code. Um, yeah, definitely go and check that out, Seeing is Believing. I'll tweet it afterwards as well. Yep. OK, so the question was, is there a way we can write a code to avoid non-determinism? The answer is yes. Stop using Ruby. Go and use Haskell. <laughs> Maybe not the answer you're looking for. Um, I think that non-determinism is something that we like as Ruby developers. It's part of the attraction of Ruby, is that we don't have to be very specific at the outset about what's going to happen in our program. And it allows a whole class of programs that would not be possible otherwise. Okay? Every language will have non-determinism in it somewhere. Any language that's got I.O., for example, you cannot guarantee at compile time what the I.O. is going to be. Um, there are probably ways we could reduce non-determinism or even guard it so we can say this bit is non-deterministic, but I think if the program works properly, it will return this type. You could do something like that. I think that's very complex. This is an idea I'm kind of interested in exploring over the next year or two. You know, the idea of how do we kind of marry this non-deterministic language with trying to get guarantees about strong typing or static typing. Um, but I don't yet know what the answer is going to be to that. Any more? OK. Oh, there's more hands up. OK. Uh, go right-hand side first. OK. So the question is, what do I think about gradual type systems like um, TypeScript? Um, so gradual typing systems are uh, perhaps a little bit different in intent. Um, in gradual typing systems, as far as I understand it, you add type annotations as you go. So you're saying to the compiler, this is the type of this thing. And the compiler then does a check. And then does something called type erasure. It, it says, OK, I've checked it. I'm happy that it's valid. And it throws it away. And at the runtime, it never uses that information again. Um, I think that it's probably not going to catch on. I think if you are prepared to write the annotations, you're probably going to be happy enough to move to a strongly typed language. So maybe something like Elm instead that compiles onto JavaScript rather than using TypeScript. It's seen as a stopgap movement. I, I've never really seen it used that successfully. But I have, you know, I'm sure people do, but I've never seen it used that successfully because if you're only kind of half thinking about types, you don't get the consistency, you don't get the strong guarantees. But you do have all the extra effort of having to go along and annotate your code and deal with situations where you don't really know what the type is going to be or the type is very complex. So the question was, could the approach I was using be extended to Erlang Dialyzer? OK. Um, you, you could do some kind of type reconstruction in Erlang. It would probably be more successful than it would be in Ruby. Um, Erlang's interesting, actually, because they use, um, oh, what's the name of the approach? Uh, property typing to give some guarantees. So is it the tools that, that use property checking to give some guarantees about safety rather than using static types. And property testing is kind of, it'll find a value and then try and break it, basically. It'll try all sorts of different things in there and see what breaks it. Um, that's surprisingly successful. I think tools like that are probably going to be successful enough that doing something like type reconstruction is not worth the effort. It wouldn't give you any better guarantees. OK, we're out of time, exactly zero minutes. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>